Coming up next on stage, we have someone that is very passionate about health and wellness. She owns a juice brand in the Washington, D.C. area called Drink, J-R-I-N-K. And she owns a, um, another brand called Apothecary, which is other types of health products. And they take the approach of doing an omni-channel omni business, which means partnering with local businesses and selling through a lot of different ways. And um, she comes from venture capital, decided to focus on health and wellness. It's my friend Shizu Okuza. Oh. Hi, guys. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, my name is Shizu. Like, she went to the zoo, as Charlie said. Thank you for having me. Uh, so we've been around for about five, six years. How many of you guys have maybe heard of us? J or I and K. We don't know how to spell drink, but J with a juice. Great. Uh, so we, my former background was at Goldman Sachs on the trading floor. I used to be in distressed investing. Uh, focusing in uh, retail and health and wellness and consumer brands. So fast forward a few years later, uh, I actually moved to D.C. to work at the World Bank after living in Bali for about three months to get my Ayurvedic uh, yoga teacher license. So there was like a lot of experience firsthand with raw food and healing your body from within. After I moved back to DC, uh, there was a real market uh, opening at the time. Uber Eats didn't exist, Postmates didn't exist. There were no companies really offering fresh juice in a way that I felt was approachable. Often I think health and wellness and juice can come across as like crunchy or woo woo, but we wanted something more of our experience, something that was actually could be maybe a little more stylish, something that could be more fun something that could be approachable and a real brand. So this was five years ago. And uh, so I quit my job and uh, we found a shared kitchen facility. How many of you guys are interested in getting like a shared kitchen or like your own commissary? Great. So we started at Union Kitchen in Washington, DC. So they were one of the first sort of like incubator kitchens. And we rented about 200 square feet inside uh, their facility and did like a weekend and weeknight situation. So while working, we would uh, go to the kitchen late at night, juice, take that product in the morning and deliver it to our customers first thing in the morning. So we actually started as a tech company and as an online company. Uh, and so we had no intention of really opening stores originally. I don't know if this works. So this is one of our locations. How many of you guys have locations? I just want to know. Okay, great. And how many of you guys are looking to get into delivery or are doing delivery already? Great, okay, that's helpful. So we actually started vice versa online first, and we quickly realized five, six years ago for a juice brand, if you're selling product at you know $10 a pop, it's very hard to get someone to come in and try your product without, especially online, if they haven't tried it before. And so we kind of tapped ourselves out with doing events and gym tastings and everything. And we realized that people really wanted to still just buy one juice versus three or five or six juices because it doesn't make sense to do a delivery for just one bottle. So our cost of acquisition was a way to open stores. And so we actually share spaces. We have seven locations in the D.C. area five of which are juice bars, and we actually do juices, smoothies, smoothie bowls, and everything. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But the main premise here is that we never actually built out our own store. We share spaces within gyms and yoga studios. So the way you go about that is, you know, there's no formula for it. It literally is knocking on doors and building relationships, and it takes a lot of sweat equity. Um, but this is one of our locations here that's beside a nail salon. And we focus a lot more on the experience. And uh, I think something about being direct to consumers that you really do need to put a lot of effort and time and thoughtfulness about how you curate your spaces so people will spread the word for you. Um, our tagline here is wealthy is the new wealthy. So trading up you know, the finance background for really wealthy being more about physical, mental, spiritual well-being and not just financial wealth. Uh, I don't know if this is working. Is it me? 
Um, our company, Drink, J-R-I-N-K, Juicery. You can find us on social or you can literally, literally Google J-R-I-N-K. Uh, so 50% of our business is online. We do deliver, there's, the slides are up there, I guess. I don't know about this one. Uh, so 50% of our company is online and we do home delivery. So how that works is basically our in-store customers, if they buy two or three times, we usually keep in contact with them and let them know, hey, your first delivery would be on the house. And so the goal ultimately with our store locations is that we can acquire emails, keep in touch with that customer, and ultimately convert them to being online. Because we felt five years ago that's what we wanted in a busy lifestyle. We might not want to go to a store per se. So 30% of our business is also based on subscriptions. So if you're looking to get online, I think you do need to look at sort of the radius of your region and your city because if you're going to do, so we outsource certain things, including doing the deliveries. We outsource the last mile from our commissary, which is the mothership or what I call the hub. I know, our, I don't know if the slide, the back room. Okay. So about us there, um, so we have the drink brand there, which is our juice side. You see our Black Magic Activated Charcoal, which is one of our most popular blends. And then our second business, which I won't really talk about for the purposes of today, but if you're interested, feel free to come up to me later. Uh, it's Apothecary, so it's an online, uh, what I call the pharmacy of the future, pharmacy with an F. So we customize and personalize herbal blends for people based on your lifestyle and your unique sort of like health goals. And then thirdly is our wealthy woman. So we're really creating and putting an effort into like our content and community side of what we do. Perfect. So bigger and broader, I think, you know, five years ago when we first started, we didn't know that we wanted to be, to be honest, like a juice company. We felt that juice just happened to be at that time, the product opening into getting into the wellness scene. We very much have evolved over time to now have juices we make our fresh made nut milks by hand. We're raw and we are bottled in glass. And so we do not HPP our product, but that allows us to be 100% direct to consumer. And I think if you are going to open stores, in my personal opinion, I think you stay raw because that, that's the reason customers are going to come to your store. If you're going to HPP, you might as well go big and wholesale and really focus in on that. That's, again, just my personal opinion of what I've learned over the years. So that was drink. Um, we have our multiple locations. And then our business online is 100% juice, raw, subscription-based, um, and is actually the more profitable side of our business. But the online side would not exist without actually having our stores because people not, would not have found out about us. So if you are thinking about omni-channel, I would highly recommend kind of like writing down sort of your core expertise of, okay, you are going to be then responsible for all of your marketing. You have to be responsible for store staffing. And I would say 80% of my time is spent on staffing and people and restaurant management, which is not necessarily what you would think of when you think of a tech company. Uh, and then really the, the main layer, though, is going to be your online and having a really smooth, kinked out um, operations. So our history, again, this was uh, not a linear path of how we had started. In 2014, uh, we quit our jobs and I, you know, I hired my first employee at the time. We now have about 35 people, of which we're 99% women and 100% minority, which we are very, very proud of. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so that was 2014. And we since in 2015 opened about five shared space locations. So again, that's about 50 square feet where we literally had a fridge, a counter and a staffed salesperson managing our juice bar locations inside of a yoga studio or a gym or a bar studio. We close some of them and then we open some of them. You have to be very nimble and um, think about, you know, how you want to do the marketing in the very beginning. I will say, looking back, I wish that, um, you know, we probably had spent a little more money and focus on maybe opening one flagship location and really focusing our efforts on that versus scattering ourselves very, very wide across multiple cities and across multiple places. Um, so I would say, looking back, that's probably one thing. Um, I wish I had done. We were 100% bootstrapped, so I put my savings in, put in $25,000 to start where we are today. 
Um, and then we raised a, a round of funding in 2015 and then again in 2017 um, for our flagship locations and expanding our delivery business. So, and then 2016 was when we first opened our location that had more space. I do believe that the juice world is changing quite a bit to now, to now if you're gonna be focused on juice, you should go big and wholesale. Again, this is just my personal opinion. Uh, if you're gonna go open with locations, I do think you need to think about other items to offer in your stores. Just juice that's pre-bottled in a cooler does not really provide that experience for customers to say, oh, I'm gonna come back here just for juice versus I can come for a smoothie and maybe grab a juice in the morning if I'm rushed. So thinking through, if you're gonna open a location, what is your full menu offering really gonna look like? So we use, we, are, we use our juices in our smoothies and we use our juices in our smoothie bowls, but that way we can really push and upsell our juices as well as with our made to order items. So hopefully that's like some practical tips of like, you don't need to necessarily have kale and bananas and like all that stuff necessarily at your locations to offer those items, but you can leverage the ingredients and the products that you have on your juices to upsell again and use into your smoothies. Um, and we used to also make lattes so we can use our nut milks to offer that. And, you know, turmeric lattes are very popular. Matcha lattes are very popular. So you can actually really offer that sort of full experience in your locations. Uh, finally, so uh, this year was a big year for us where we finally signed, I think in everybody's food business uh, dreams is to have a relationship with Whole Foods. Uh, so 2018 marked the year for us where we're actually going to be opening locations inside Whole Foods locations. So this allows us to stay that direct-to-consumer model. And I do think that after five, six years now, pop-ups and shared spaces and all of that online omni-channel has become very sexy. That said, it's sexy, it could be, but you really need to think about how do you deliver that experience because it's so much more than what the eyes look at. You have to manage payroll, you have to manage your staff, you have to manage your drivers, and you have to manage a lot of spoilage, potential spoilage, um, if you don't have your supply chain in check. So the omni-channel must-haves. Uh, so here I talk a little bit about just two main um, areas that we are going to be focusing on because 50% of our business, again, is online and 50%, 45% is retail. And then we do 5% of sort of events and catering and 5% um, included in that is like our apothecary business as well, which is still small since we only started that two months ago. But so the mothership there that you see, which is the hub, so basically, and you'll see in the next slide what that looks like, is we actually spent thousands, tens of thousands of dollars building out a supply chain app that holds all of our recipes and also holds all of our customer data and CRM platform and also provides sort of like packing sheets for how much you're going to make that day, packing sheets to throw into your delivery boxes, how much your stores orders from supplies to juices to frozen fruit down to paper towels. So everything is literally at the kitchen and everything is housed in our supply chain app. How many of you guys have sort of like a supply chain app or what, I'm curious to know, like what do you guys use? Yeah, or, I have no idea what that is. Does, does it, is it full encompassing of like what you need to accomplish your business? 98%, well, we should chat, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? So we built our own. So we built our own called The Hub. And I'm happy to chat about that also because it's a Shopify app in development. So if any of you guys use Shopify online or in stores or any other platform, we can actually integrate that into your system. And it's made for omni-channel business um, juice companies and or wholesale or really anything. Um, but it allows you to limit your spoilage because at the store level, you, you can take inventory three times a day. And then it also syncs up with your sales from that time last year. So you kind of know exactly how much you should always have at a given time and how much you should order at a given time. Because I think in our industry, spoilage is a huge thing. Uh, so again, like you can take inventory every single day. I'm trying to see behind the fiddle leaf. Um, In-store pickups is also another one that we offer. So if customers order online, they want to have the convenience of coming to any of our locations during our store hours to pick up. So our drivers are responsible for store deliveries, the juices, 
as well as in-store store customer deliveries, as well as the last mile customer deliveries to their um, business. And then we also have inventory for balance sheet and costing. So at any given time, because there's costs associated with the juices, whatever we have in stock at the stores, that's our balance sheet. And that's really helpful as you look at like your QuickBooks or like your P&L is that you sometimes have no idea how much your stuff costs or what you're sitting on. It's really, really helpful to have a number behind that because you know what you're sitting on and you need to convert that quickly into cash. Um, and then on the, on, uh, the online, so if you actually go to drink.com, you can actually see you can get online um, on-demand delivery and you can also get scheduled delivery and you can get, again, that in-store pickup experience. So we try to offer, if you're a direct-to-consumer, you want to be everywhere and as convenient for that customer as much as possible. And so that does just require a lot more um, availability and real-time updates, which again, syncs to the mothership. Uh, so we outsource uh, to Postmates. So if any of you guys have Postmates for that last mile delivery, they can actually work with you on the API side, which is an automatic push integration onto your website to do that delivery for you. So if a customer, you can still go to like your website and order, and then that'll just push a notification to Postmates to come pick it up from your store locations. Again, happy to talk more about that after. Um, but again, so we do the scheduled online uh, dispatch notifications, so when the driver comes in and picks the box up, they'll push a notification and then the customer end gets sort of, oh, hey, your order is on the way and it's getting delivered. And then, hey, your order has been delivered, please go downstairs to check it out. And then, hey, one day later, we'll text you or email and say, will you want to refer a friend? Come follow us on social media. Here's $5 towards your next order. But it's really thinking through the entire customer experience because you can't just lose that customer. You want to always stay in touch. And that is the responsibility of being omnichannel as well as direct to consumer. So um, this is our app that you can kind of see some screenshots here, the top and the bottom right. You can kind of see how you know, clearly our staff did not take some inventory logs and there's errors. That's when we have notifications for our manager to go to our staff and say, hey, yo, you have not taken your inventory for the day. We need that to place our order for the next day. And we also get email notifications. And then on the left side is our successful inventory where we take it between opening, midday, and close. Um, and we're, again, we are, um, this is a supply, the Shopify app. So if you guys are interested, we can talk about how this could work for your guys' site. Uh, the bottom right are custom juices. So based on five years of data in our stores as well and the recipes being in the hub, we can customize juice flavors for every customer. So that's something that I think a lot of people have been interested in, right? Is like, can I get a little more ginger in my juice or green kale and like less beets because I hate beets and so many people apparently hate beets. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, but the custom juices is based on the fact that your recipe can then pull from those different um ingredients that are inside the hub. Um, again, hopefully this is not uh, too confusing, but I think at, over time, if you really are pushing online and direct to consumer and omni-channel, personal, like, personalization is gonna be a really big thing. Personalized wellness and personalized nutrition is huge in our industry at this point. Um, so it's like really getting up on that and being ahead of the curve, especially in your market area. And the way we really leverage our omni-channel experience is we also offer consults. So this is not that we're, you know, accredited dietitians or medic, you know, medical doctors, but we, we do leverage the experience that we've met over thousands of customers in our stores. And we offer 15-minute free consults with customers. They just book it online through our website and we'll give you a call and we'll talk about our reboots, which is also known as cleanses but we don't, talk, we don't call them cleanses versus sort of like kickstarts to a health and wellness routine. Um, so, so many people have customer you know, questions, you know, is it, um, what's good for me? Do I work out? Um, this is my first time. Can I, you know, is it really hard? All those questions and insecurities are things that like, we don't, we don't need to come to our store, especially customers don't like coming into the store and saying those things. They'd rather just kind of like text you or talk on the phone. So again, that's like a free service that we offer, but leverages our store staff, and ultimately they can order online. All right, so I don't think retail is dead. Boring retail is very dead. So really thinking about how do you engage with your 
customers. There, it's up there too, guys. So that was um, a kiosk that we had at Whole Foods. Um, the small counter and the fridge, a lot of plants. Um, and you really got to work with your vendors on how much space you have. But I think, you know, you don't want that to be a very uncomfortable experience for the customer. So just always, always put your customer hat on and say, would I want to come back here? The first time might be good, but do I really want to come back and have, be that repeat customer? So really create that experience, make it warm and inviting, have your best staff there. Um, and then I think on just touching a little bit on financially, you know, they do make money. You just have to staff it well. We only have one person at a given store at any given time. Uh, and then, you know, they do create about two times more of a loyal customer base than just online as well. Um, they're not hard, but they are, they can be very hard if you don't find the right real estate. So I do think prime real estate is very important and making sure you know, whatever, if you do decide to go that shared space route, that brand is also like, you know, quote unquote, on brand with what you offer. All right, I'm hopping around here. Uh, so key lessons, I would say, number one, don't do everything yourself. Uh, you know, we, we did the deliveries in the very beginning. They suck. They're really early in the morning. They are tiring. It's not your core expertise. And, you know, my myself, like doing the delivery, lifting boxes, it's just, it, it can wear you out outsource it and it might cost a little more money than you might originally have thought. Well, everything does, but you know, don't do everything. If you go omni-channel and direct to consumer, you tend to have a tendency to want to do everything, including deliveries and customers and service and then staff and everything. Um, so just outsource your core sort of non-core tasks. Number two, process and people. Um, so those are really the number two things. I think if your processes are down and you have checklists in place, you have those apps and you set people up for success and you can layer the people on top of that, you truly can have that formula to create a recipe for success. If you just have people with no processes, you're not setting them up for success. So just always think if you were hiring someone, how would you want to train them? What processes do you have in place um, to make sure that they're set up for success? Um, and then again, if without your operations in check or your supply chain, any kind of creative marketing or branding is very futile. People will tell you that very clearly on Yelp over time. Number three, innovate for the customer in five years, and you can't just serve that person as they are today. They're changing. The market is changing very, very, very quickly. And so when I talk about personalized nutrition or customized juices, it's so important to be thinking about what does that customer want in five years and how have they involved? And that was really apothecary and that's why it had started for us is that we believe that people are not just juicing anymore. They really want to upgrade their everything that they're doing in their day to be the maximum nutrition. And that's all about like biohacking and mushrooms and adaptogens and all that stuff that we're seeing now. Uh, and then finally, revenue is great. So let's not get caught up too much in like the funding and investors. The best thing to do is generate revenue. It comes into your bank account. It's, pro you know, it's, it's money that you hard earned and customers will come back for that. Relying on investor funding and not having a sustainable business model is not going to be successful in the long term. And you're really outsourcing sort of the, the failure to be later. So really think about your core unit economics from the store level to the, the online side and how you can really drive profitability, which will be, again, the later panel that we have today. Um, but, you know, I think just have ownership, keep control. Investors are not always going to be right. I think that's it. Q&A. That's our apothecary, by the way. So we have our sleigh all day, which is like our matcha blend, uh, and then our drink blend up there. So thank you. <laughs> questions? Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Thank you Hi. For that. If you can just stand up and see your name, where you're from. Love sure. To... Nina Curtis from Los Angeles. Hi. And thank you for your presentation. How are you handling the staff employment um, acquisition and then handling it as you're spread out for education and consistency? Of yeah. It's a, it's a good, it's a very good question. I think we still learn to be very frank over time. Uh, but what we currently do 
our, our org chart is so that once we had, you know, three locations, we had one manager. The moment you kind of hit that beyond three, we found that we needed to hire two people. And then when we hit five, seven, we actually ended up hiring a manager for each location, which financially did not work for us. So we ended up paying more for really experienced staff. And we hired two managers where we have an AGM and a GM to manage all locations. And so, and then we ended up paying above minimum wage. So this maybe sounds a little bit counterintuitive of, you know, but we wanted to provide a real experience, you know, with pink and gold and plants. Like if your staff is not trained and doesn't know how to talk about the product and doesn't look like you're even customer is passionate about the product, no one's going to buy that and no one's going to come back. So we've invested a lot more in training, but also people that are committed and customers. So we pay about $15 an hour, um, which is quite a bit, for, especially for our kind of business. But we have seen returns on that. Uh, and we do pay you know, above market for two managers that are amazing um, and manage all day to day on the two locations. So they go in and out and train the staff every day. And then the inventory and checklists are all again on the, uh, the hub. So it's automated, so they just know what to do every day. Over here. Hi. Hi, Aurelio Torres, Austin, Hi. Texas. Hi. Uh, can you Hot elaborate bear. more on uh, sharing the spaces? Sure, yeah. So uh, sharing spaces. I don't know if I can. <coughs> um, so all of our locations have, again, like that fridge and counter model, but basically, what I did in the very beginning, for example, was go to like gyms. I literally created a Google Excel sheet of all the gyms in the area, all the yoga studios in the area, all the bar studios. And we didn't go for like the equinoxes or like the big ones just because we felt, A, the reply rate for that would probably be very low in the very beginning. And then B, you know, as a local brand, what do customers really want? And so we think about how do you scale local? And so that just meant we wanted to make sure we worked with gyms and yoga studios that aligned with our values and where our customer was. So we literally, you know, did an event there perhaps, and we did a tasting there with juices, built the relationship, found the decision maker, so probably the owner of the business, and said, hey, look, we can actually share a percentage of revenue with you, or we can actually pay you rent or a license fee. And then that way you guys get an amenity juice bar as a benefit to your gym for free, frankly, and you get um, foot traffic that you otherwise wouldn't have had. Everything is a sales process and everything is a pitch. You just need to think about if you were the gym owner, how do you make it really easy? How do you make it attractive? How do you build a social media following where they're like, oh, I want to tap into that too, so that you make it beneficial and a win-win for both. I hope that's helpful. Uh, it depends on the location, actually. Like, rent rent is a very scary thing for brick and mortar. And I think in this day and age, when customers are shifting online quicker than we know it, having shorter-term leases or terms is, is very advantageous. And then having a smaller build-out cost in the varying is also very advantageous. Because if you don't have a long lifetime to, like, kind of spread, depreciate that out, it's, it's not worth it. So I would say I would focus on sharing revenue more than I would do um, rent. Yeah. Hi, love. Hi. Right here. My name is Hannah. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to see everyone here. It's so exciting. Thank you had an amazing presentation. Thank you so much for Thank just you. being transparent and helping everyone in this room. I have two questions. One, with your technology, are you going to... Uh, resell that to other juiceries or do any kind of consulting? Yeah, so we are doing that now. Again, if you're interested, please email me, shizu at drink.com. Uh, we, we can integrate that onto your website. We have a CTO that does all of that work. Uh, and then we, will, we are creating like a Shopify app that will be integratable on everyone's back end. But it's, it's really the nonsense. And we don't even have a name for it, frankly, to be honest. Like it's, it's just been something that we built over time that solved our problems, limited our spoilage, and our spoilage rate is 2%. Wow. It's minimal. Um, and we're raw and glass. Wow. So our shelf life is five days it's, or less. Awesome. Um, the last question I would have is, how did Whole Foods, do they have a juice bar in there as well? Or how did you kind of go through that sales process with them? Yeah, so most of the Whole Foods, every Whole Foods I find is very different. And I'm sure Amazon's going to come in and kind of streamline things. 
That uh, Whole Foods that we signed for is their new headquarters location based in Tyson's. So that location, we it allowed us to say, okay, we can actually create the drink experience in that store from scratch and not just shove it in. So the downside with shared space retail is that you're, you really are shoving it in, right? Like you're putting in a counter and a fridge in an experience that wasn't built for you. So you have to be really strategic about those places that you build that with. And so Whole Foods just happened to be, we were lucky that it was um, just the build out time. We use Shopify. So I, I highly recommend if you're gonna go online to use a whole omni-channel platform. There's really not that many yet. Um, Shopify is great online. They're not as strong in POS. Like if you're gonna do POS, tipping is a great feature to keep your staff and retain them. Shopify didn't introduce that till now. So I, I highly recommend something that will allow your CRM or customer management to be all on the same thing so that you can see lifetime value, you can see return rate, you can really measure and keep track of your data. But Shopify, yeah, hi. Hi, Chris Good. Hi. Yeah, so because we are raw and direct to consumer, we don't need um, necessarily to have a HACCP. And that was a decision that we made over time. So if you're in wholesale, you will need to have a HACCP. I do think that a state requirement and national requirements are gonna be different, but we're regulated in the Fairfax County, which we don't need to have a HACCP. We do have one though, but we, and that's just for precautionary sake. But um, for us at Whole Foods, because again, we're not gonna be on their shelves and we're staffing it, we don't need to have that from their requirement, but they will, they have audited our kitchen. No, we will not be selling our juices through Whole Foods. We will be focusing on, you know, the integrity of our product that we've built over the years, but we will be doing our apothecary business into the drink Whole Foods shelves, which are the Whole Foods shelves that we're talking to now. So it's really thinking through again, like, and we'll talk about that later today is the driving profitability and like, you learn over time. Fresh, fresh is hard, man. It's hard. <laughs> it's so hard. Hi. Hey. Is it working? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Sure. Um, I've got two questions. One, do you have any fridges without counters, without staff anywhere? Uh, we don't. I mean, I think the whole genius bar thing is like a really cool experience, but uh, we don't have that right now just because our staff needs somewhere. Like we can't just think about the customer too. Like our staff need to have somewhere to put their stuff and like all, all of that. So I do think the bar counter is kind of like a place where we have signage and education as well. And you can't just do the fridge. But I have seen models where you can put that in like a shopping mall or like downstairs in an elevator in a, in a department store or something. So I think you can be strategic. Depends how long term you're gonna do it. I think if you're gonna do just a fridge and like kind of a pop-up situation, probably limit that to a weekend or like a cool sexy show for like a week or something. I only say that because I, I think for the customer end, it can be a little awkward over time. Yeah, That's we, just my, again, my opinion. We've got um, um, a shop and shop in um, uh, a gym. Yeah. But we also have at one of their other locations, just a fridge and for us, it works. Because got it. the customer knows it. Yep. Just wondering how it was for you. Yeah. And then uh, my second question was, um, you said you do personalized, customized juices. Yep. Um, do you charge the customer more for a personalized We do, juice? we do, what yeah, do we do. Charge? We charge about like $12. And what do you charge normally for? $10. Okay, so it's yep. $2 extra. Okay, yep. cool. amazing. I think if you're raw on glass and you have that experience, by the way, you can, I actually think people will be pay, pay out more for like premium and good quality juices. A lot, a lot, especially your subscribers. Yeah, a lot. Excuse um, me, can you describe your relationship with organic growers? We'll talk later. Uh, so 70%, I think we, I think there's a lot of demands on us as manufacturers to be very, very honest on being everything, right? Organic, raw, gluten-free, vegan, local, fair trade, all of that. I think you need to write it out to say like, what's most important to you and your values? For us, we said glass. For us, we said raw. For us, we said local and woman owned and minority oriented. So that does not mean we're 100% organic. It's just, we're not. But we are 
90% local where we can source. And then our citrus comes from like California. Uh, and then so it's keeping true to, again, like what those core values are. I don't, I think if we were 100% organic, we'd probably have to charge closer to $12 for every single bottle and then $15 probably for a custom blend. So, Hi, I, I, sorry to interrupt. I actually think the organic question has died down over the years, by the way, as well. So if that's something of help for you guys too. Like, I actually don't think customers are saying like, are you organic as much as are you like, what, how much sugar do you have? What happens to your end product with a glass? We, in New Zealand, uh, our focus is reusing, recycling and refilling. Yeah. Do you guys have a big focus on that? We do. We do recycle as well. So part of the experience is that when customers bring back their bottles, we can actually um, link them up into our loyalty platform and get their emails. So that way we can keep in touch with them and again, convert them online to ultimately order online. So it's a great way to keep your customer. If you're not going to retain sort of like a loyalty or recycling program, you're probably going to lose that customer. So we felt that, again, being raw in that glass has advantages and it's not just, it does limit your scale, but it also increases retention. So there's a trade-off. Do you have your own register at Whole Foods? We will, yeah. So that won't open till later this year, but we will. So we've been talking to Charlie about the countertop X lines. Yeah. Hi. It's a great question. So it's something that we've been looking at. Um, and so it's thinking through, okay, for delivery, it's glass and raw. For stores, it's glass and raw. Maybe for online nationwide shipping, we go raw and plastic. That's a lot. It's just a lot of packaging and storage. Our kitchen right now is 3,000 square feet. It's actually not that big. But uh, so we're running out of space already. So I think from a trade-off perspective, we've been, we're investing more in our apothecary business to go nationwide for shipping, but that'll allow us to spread the awareness for our drink brand if you're ever in town or in the area. But we are looking to expand the delivery radius of our juices in the region over there. And another business model you really can think of is franchise and or opening more commissaries in other cities, like kind of like more like the Blue Apron model. So you focus on like the raw and glass in multiple cities and focus on premium. That just requires a lot more investment, I think, in, in um, committing to stores and juice. Right here. Hi. Hey, um, my company uses reusable glass as well, and I was wondering if you do bottle deposits, and if you do, how many of those you get back? Yeah, so we, we do, yeah. So yeah. We, it syncs to our loyalty platform, which, again, is great with Shopify. You actually have a lot of apps that you can plug in, so you don't need to create, like, a... A, a brand new app from scratch you can white label cool. so, but we do yeah if so we take the bottles back and then we give them points so we say ten dollars for ten points no a hundred points for every bottle returned and technically so it's like a ten bottles for every juice so it's you, like a dollar per bottle essentially deposit? basically yeah okay. and you can alternatively do um you know uh, get 25 cents off your juice at that time i've seen that happen the the downside with that i think is that not everybody wants to spend then and there. They kind of want to bring back like 50 bottles at the same time and yes. not buy anything. So it'll, you allow them optionality. Yeah. We have to wrap. Yep, we've, uh, we have to wrap it up. we've got time for one more question. Okay. okay. Hi. Yes. Yeah, oh, please okay. stand. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we use Shopify uh, online as well as uh, POS, and then our hub syncs up as a Shopify app. So uh, I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with Shopify. There's an apps tab at the left column. Click on that, you can go to the store. We created our own that's not public yet, but again, we can talk about that. That app um, basically includes all of our ingredients that we use and then the recipes that we use. And then based on the custom recommendation through the website, um, we basically have products on the Shopify end that have different variants. Uh, are you familiar with the Shopify platform? Okay, I don't want to go into too much detail because it's, it's very boring. But with the very different variants that we offer, um, that's based on a quiz that customers will take. So it's like more greens, tick mark. More ginger, tick mark. No, gin, uh, no beets, tick mark. And then that'll basically filter out what the final recipe is going to be for our app. Um, 
to download into the kitchen. All the, all the staff needs to do is export bottle count. And then that's because that's the only thing that they are required to do. Once they export bottle count of each flavor, um, that goes into like our recipe model. Yeah, so we've built a model separately that's um, just like a very fancy Excel sheet. Uh, and then it tells you how many cases of cucumbers you're gonna have to pull for that morning pineapple for that morning, and it allows us to limit our spoilage both on the ingredient side as well as on the juice side. Yeah, so we make fresh for every single order. We don't sit on any inventory. We do not, um, it's been something that we've thinking about if you have enough volume and scale is like make, you know, I don't know, 3,000 bottles a day, every single day, but you're more prone to spoilage, but you're, you at least allow for more inventory. That said, I think customers really want that made fresh real time update. So we still make fresh every single day. And so your, your numbers can vary over time. All right, let's give it up for Shizu. Thank you.